Okay, this presentation will cover the first simple machine, which is the lever. There's a total of six different simple machines, the lever, the wheel axle, the pulley, the inclined plane, the screw, and the wedge. Now, when we talk about simple machines, we need to talk about something called work, and I'll go through that uh, momentarily, but it's essentially defined as force times distance. Now, when we talk about mechanical advantage, um, when we design a machine, we design machines typically to make it easier, to make it easier for us to lift or to move or to pull something. Now, the definition for mechanical advantage is defined as load over effort, right? So if I have, say I have a lever system and I have, I have a lever system and I have a 100 pound person on one side and a 30 pound person on the other side. Now, what do I have to do in order for the 30 pound person to lift the 100 pound person? If I simply move the center point, which is what we call a fulcrum to the right, then the 30 pound person can lift the 100 pound person. If we say that this person is the load and this person is the effort, then we have defined mechanical advantage as 100 divided by 30, which is greater than one. And when we have a mechanical advantage, when mechanical advantage is calculated greater than one, there is, then there is an advantage to the system, or to the machine. So a mechanical advantage four to one basically tells us that we're able to magnify the amount of force that we're able to lift or push or pull compared to the amount of effort force that we're gonna be lifting, right? So in this particular case down here, we've been able to reduce the amount of effort force in this particular scenario here by manipulating the distance, right? So this particular box, the force is actually, the amount of force that it takes to push the box is lower than it is in this scenario. And the reason for that is because the distance when pushing it up to the ramp, let's say is four feet compared to the distance it takes to actually lift the box, which is one foot. So the force has gone down, but the distance has increased. And here, the force has gone up, but the distance has decreased. But the work, which is defined as force times distance, will be the same in both cases. Okay, so we define work as the amount of force that we're applying, um, the amount of force that we apply times the distance that the object is traveling. But in order to have work, the force that's being applied has to be parallel to the, to the distance the object is traveling. If the distance that the object travels is perpendicular, then we do not have work. We also don't have work if the object is not moving. So if I push against a wall and the wall doesn't move, I'm applying force, but the wall doesn't go anywhere. So, I'm not, so I do not have work. So like I said, in order to have an advantage to a machine, you have to have a the equation for a mechanical advantage has to be greater than one. If it's less than one, then you do not have an advantage in your machine. So there's two different types of mechanical advantages. And the first one is what we call ideal mechanical advantage. An ideal mechanical advantage, when you think of the term ideal, what is it that you think about? You think about something that's perfect, right? Now the perfect machine does not take friction into consideration. And in order to calculate a perfect machine, we have to divide, we have to take the ratio of the distance traveled by the effort force divided by the distance traveled by the resistance force. Now the actual mechanical advantage of a machine is the force resistance divided by the force effort. And these are both measurable values, right? So if I am pushing a block across a table, right? And let's say this block weighs 10 pounds. If this table is has a lot of friction, let's say it's sandpaper, it's gonna take more force to push this block, more effort force than it would if it was say a very smooth surface, right? So um, we can measure the effort force that it actually takes to, in this particular case, push the block. And in doing so, we would actually be able to calculate the actual mechanical advantage or the efficiency of the system. 
and it, in most cases it's going to be less than 100 percent if the IMA is equal if the IMA is equal to the AMA then that means our ideal system our actual system is equal to our ideal system and we do not have any frictional loss in our machine so this is just an example of a machine that has a mechanical advantage greater than one. This represents a lever, and we'll talk about this shortly. But just thinking about it, when you use a wheelbarrow, the amount of effort force that you're applying here compared to the resistance force that you're um, lifting is much less. So Fe in this particular case would be less than your Fr, and you would have mechanical advantage. So there are some machines that are designed without a mechanical advantage. So an example of that would be, you know, a weightlifting system. You actually want it to be harder to lift the uh, lift the weights because you're actually trying to build muscle, right? So you're not trying to make it easier for yourself. So there are three different types of levers. There's a first class lever, second and a third class. And on a first class, the um, on a first class lever, your force resistance and your force effort are on opposite ends and your fulcrum is in the middle, okay? Now, the other key terms that we need to, uh, that I need to mention are the distance effort and the distance resistance. So the distance resistance will always be measured from the fulcrum to the resistance force and the distance effort will always be measured from the fulcrum to the effort force in all cases. So a first class lever can have a mechanical advantage greater than one, less than one, or um, equal to one, greater than one, or less than one, depending on where the fulcrum is. A second class lever um, is defined as the resistance would be in the middle the effort force would be on the end, and then your fulcrum would be at the other end. An example of this would be like a wheelbarrow, right? Because you're actually lifting it on this end, and the load or the weight would be here, and then the fulcrum or the wheel would actually be on the opposite end, right? So a mechanic, this particular level will always have a mechanical advantage greater than one. So think about what our IMA is, right? Our IMA, we said earlier, was DE over DR. In this particular case, your DE would be measured from the fulcrum, and it will always be greater than the DR. So a third class lever will always have a mechanical advantage greater than one. So if this is our force resistance, and this is our force effort, our DE will always be less than our dr. So if our IMA is defined as DE over dr, you can see how you'll always have a mechanical advantage less than one. Okay, so this is an example, and you can go ahead and work on this. Uh, I think working through this problem will help you to understand the calculation of levers a little bit more. And this is actually a third class lever, right? So this is your resistance force here, the weight, right? And your muscle is your effort force, and then here's your fulcrum. Okay, so your DE would be measured from here to here, and then your DR would be measured from here to here. And then you want to use the, um, there's an equation that we use when we're talking about um, equilibrium. And the equilibrium equation is Fe times DE is equal to Fr times DR. And this is a key equation in many of the problems that we're going to solve. Um, so one of the things that you need to understand when we're talking about a lever is something called moment. And we talk about moment because when you talk about a lever, the lever doesn't really move. It doesn't go left to right. It doesn't go you know, it doesn't move vertically like if you were pushing a box up and down a ramp, right? But the, the lever still does work, and it does work through something we call moment, right? So we still have force times distance, but the distance that we're talking about now is perpendicular to the force, right? 
So if this is our force resistance, then remember earlier, this is what our dr is, right? So the dr is horizontal, whereas the force is perpendicular. So if you have a force that is perpendicular to your distance, then we have something that is called moment. Okay, so there's two different kinds of moments. Um, when we talk about a lever, there's your moment resistance, and then there's your moment effort, right? So this would be your moment resistance here. So this is your FR, and this is your DR, right? And then this is your DE, and this is your FE. So your effort moment would simply be your FE times your DE, right? And if you wanted to look at your moment resistance, it would be the same thing, but you would look at the resistance values. Okay, the other thing to mention is rotational equilibrium, right? So when we talk about a lever, when a lever is in rotational equilibrium, essentially the moment for your effort is equal to the moment for your resistance, right? So moment effort is equal to moment resistance. And essentially that gives us force effort times distance effort is equal to force resistance times distance resistance. And again, like I just mentioned earlier, this is going to be a key equation in many of the formula in many of the problems that we're going to solve moving forward. Okay, so knowing what you know about rotational equilibrium, remember our rotational equilibrium equation? Okay. In these type of equations, you'll usually be giving three different values, right? So here we have our Fe, here we have our Fr, and here we've been given our DE, but our dr is something we need to solve for. So we can use our rotational equilibrium equation and rearrange it mathematically to solve for the dr. Okay, when we talk about, when we talk about a lever, um, remember that the IMA is the distance traveled by the effort force divided by the distance traveled by the resistance force. Okay, and the distance traveled by the effort force on a lever is essentially going to be a circle. The distance traveled by the resistance force is going to be a smaller circle. And if we remember, when we want to calculate the distance traveled on a circle, it's essentially their circumference of a circle, right? Now, if we look at this uh, circle here, remember this value is the dr, and this value is the de, right? So the, the radius of the smaller circle is the dr, and the radius of the bigger circle is the de, okay? So if we divide the two circumferences, remember this is 2 pi r, and this is 2 pi r, right? So essentially that would be 2 pi de divided by 2 pi dr, 2 pi's cancel out, and essentially what we're left with is IMA is equal to DE over DR, right? So if we want to calculate the IMA of a lever, all we have to do is know our DE value, we have to know our DR value, and then we just take the ratio of the two and we're able to get the IMA. So here's an example. Um, all the values have been given to you, the forces and the distances. So if you want to know your AMA, remember your AMA is equal to FR over FE, right? So if this is our FE and this is our FR, then we can get our AMA. The same for the distances, right? From here to here is our DE, and from here to here is our DR, and we can also get the IMA. So then the question becomes is why is the IMA larger than the AMA? And then this goes back to remember this is an ideal value, the perfect scenario. This is not perfect. Okay? So when the AMA is less than the IMA, then that tells us there is friction in our system. So the last thing we need to talk about is something called efficiency. And efficiency efficiency essentially takes the ratio of the AMA divided by the IMA. And the majority of machines will not be 100% efficient. If they were 100% efficient, then we would not have any work lost or friction losses in our system. 
So it basically compares the actual scenario to the ideal scenario and you're able to get